The last part of this section is conic sections. This is something that for me personally, I first learned that in, um, in pre-calculus. So I was, I was kind of surprised that it was missing, you know, from... Uh, you think you're better than us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was missing, you know, so, uh, so yeah, that was a little distressing, but then again, as I look back, although I was exposed to it in pre-calculus, I didn't really remember it. I think it was just in one year out the other. It was later that it really started to stick a bit more. So I guess this is about that time where it, <laughs> hopefully it might stick. So yeah, so with 7.5, conic sections, and, and by the way, in 7.5, there's no calculus in there either, okay? 7.5. I'm kind of a geometry guy. I've told you that before. But for that reason, I really like this section. It's because it's very, very geometric in nature. It's technically analytic geometry because we're going to be using algebra to answer geometry questions, right? And, but the geometry is really fascinating. So conic sections are sections of a cone. Sections of a cone, OK? So if you imagine a cone, all right, let me put it this way. If I draw the line where y equals x and y equals negative x, right, you have these two lines intersecting through the origin. All right. Now, if I take these lines and revolve them around the y-axis. Hourglass. Exactly. You have an hourglass, right? I'm drawing it like this, but in reality, it actually extends infinitely far down that way and that way. So it's, it's really, it's re it might be better referred to as a double cone. I have a question. Yeah. Would you even need that second line there? Which one? The x over the negative x. Oh, right. That's yeah. true. If I just did the y equals x and revolve that around, that yeah. should do the whole thing, huh? Good point. Yeah, I guess you don't need to. For this section. <laughs> yeah, one line's enough. And so that's a cone. So a conic section is a section of the cone. So what do I mean by a section of the cone? You cut it anywhere horizontally? Could be horizontally, so but really it's literally anywhere. Anywhere. Any okay. So for example, if I if you imagine a cone, I no, not a cone, but a, a plane right here. That plane is kind of it's kind of hovering above the inner the, the tip of the cone. Right. The intersection between the, the plane and the cone is a, can you see what it is? C. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it looks, like, a it looks <laughs> like an oval, but that's just because we're looking at it at an angle, right? right? That's actually a circle. So a circle <laughs> is a conic section. That's an example of a conic section, right? So a circle is a type of conic section. Basically, I'm sorry, when I see you draw something like this, I start, start stressing over freaking um, rates of change. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you got that shell shock from that test. <laughs> and pumping stuff out of it. <laughs> What if I, now, now in this case, I have a, a different plane in mind. This is a plane that's kind of at a tilt, right? So it's not horizontal like this one was, right? But it's, but it, but it's only tilted a little bit. It's not, it's, it, if I tilt it too much, right? Um, it, it, like like if, if the tilt of the plane is, if I can refer to the slope of the plane, like this has, the edge of the cone has a slope of one, right? If this, if this, if the slope of this plane was more than one, right, something different is going to happen. We're going to draw that picture next. Okay. This is just tilted a little bit, and the intersection is not going to be a circle anymore. It's like a teardrop. Uh, it's actually an ellipse. An ellipse. Oh, okay. You would actually be an ellipse. So you're going to have a shape that's going to have. 
go like that. And that's an ellipse. I guess um, in fact, every ellipse, there's ellipses come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, right? For every ellipse you can think of, it's possible to choose a plane that will intersect this cone to give you that ellipse. Tilt this plane a little more, just a little bit further. Suppose I tilt this plane so that it has a has a slope of exactly one. What car. Is it? it could be like a cardioid, right? It won't be a cardioid. It won't be a cardioid because if it's if if it's, if it's going parallel to this edge of the cone, yeah. You see how like here it, you have this point where it begins to intersect. It starts to wrap around to the other side of the cone, right? But if it's parallel... Oh, so it'd be like a rectangle, right? Yeah. If it's parallel, that means it's going to like wrap around the cone, but it never actually comes back on itself. Yeah. Right? It'll never actually close like the ellipse did. Because it's steeper, so the, the, so the plane I have in mind is something oh, more so like... Parabola. Now this is one where it's perfectly parallel to this edge, so I need to draw this so that it looks like it's parallel. Something like this. Mm -hmm. So as long as this plane is perfectly parallel to this edge of the cone, it's never gonna. You can see how the intersection is gonna begin right here. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I guess I can make that solid too. But if this if this cone was to keep extending and the plane was to keep extending, it would keep getting bigger and bigger. And that, believe it or not, is a parabola. So, uh, yeah, so it's interesting how these, some of these familiar ideas are actually sort of have a, a geometric, like, uh, common ancestry, you know? And the next one I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to intersect this with another plane, but this plane is going to actually be steeper than this edge of the cone. Okay? So imagine a cone where the intersection is steeper than the edge of the cone. Now because the because this, this plane is actually steeper than the edge of the cone, something unexpected is going to happen here. See, because this one is parallel, it never actually touches the bottom half of the cone. Right? Same thing over here. These, no, they only intersect the top half of the cone, right? The top half of the double cone. Hyperbole? Mm hmm. Hyperbola. Hyperbola. Hyperbole is something in literature. English. <laughs> <laughs> I would say hyperbolic, but I was like, no, that might not be good. <laughs> that's a movie. <laughs> yeah, so in this case, um, yeah, and, and this one, it, you know, it just misses the bottom half of the cone, of the double cone, right? But because this one is steeper, you can see that if I was to keep extending it like this, then you would notice that there's going to be a section right here but it's also going to intersect somewhere over here. And that would be a hyperbola. Two branches of hyperbola, right? So like cinch, toast. Mm -hmm. And that plays into the tensional parallel now. Well, the graph of a cinch of the coast <laughs> won't, won't appear here, but it won't appear. yeah.
Yeah, so there's, there's so you can see that there's basically one, two, three, four types of conic sections, right? Four types of conic sections. There's, there's actually more, but the other ones are called trivial or degenerate conic sections. For example, it sounds like people don't hang out with. <laughs> if you take a plane and intersect it right at the tip of the cone, then the intersection would be nothing. A dot. Like a dot. Right? A dot. Yeah. So a dot is a trivial conic section, right? Or if I if I was a, if I was to make a perfectly vertical plane that went right through the um, y-axis, a cone? Would you just be a cone? It would be the, it would be the intersection of the cone and that plane. Oh. A triangle. Well, it, would, it, would, it would just be these intersecting lines. Oh. oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> So that's kind of a trivial conic section, but these are the interesting ones. These are the ones we care about. And you know, uh, we have seen graphs of, con of circles before, right? Something like that. We haven't done a whole lot with graphs of ellipses, but we saw that with parametric equations, it's not so bad. <laughs> We have worked a lot with parabolas, especially in pre-calculus, especially ones that go like this. But you know, if you if you get fancy, you can even do something that looks like this. Way fancy, yeah. All right. And hyperbolas. Well, we spent a lot of time with one of them. That's y equals one over x. But you know, we're also going to we also want to consider if ones that look like like this. So the like. Concrete definition of hyperbola is like a curve with a perfect reflection? Yeah, so as far as a concrete definition, the concrete geometry definition is this. The concrete algebra definition I'm about to give you for all of these, <laughs> right? Uh, I'll start with this one since you asked, right? Hyper what, what, what hyperbolas have in common is that they look like this. The equations of hyperbolas look like every hyperbola has a center. This one has a center here, this one has a center. So both of these hyperbolas are centered at the origin, right? But in general, if I have a hyperbola centered at HK, I could have, it might look like this, perhaps, right? This would be X minus H squared, squared. over A squared minus Y minus K squared over b squared equaling 1. You see that? Actually, the equations of hyperbolas fall into one of two different categories. Either this one or y minus k squared over a squared and x minus h squared over b squared. Subtraction, when you subtract it, it's which order you subtract in. So these are technically diff different, although very similar. But um, this one has two x-intercepts and no y-intercepts. Mm -hmm. This one has two y-intercepts and no x-intercepts, right? So like, like a hyperbola that looks like this would be of this type. In this case, h and k are zero. But a hyperbola such as this one would look like one. Look like this. Yeah, it has two x-intercepts. Right. Is one over x squared not a, considered a hyperbola? This is a hyperbola, but this is a hyperbola that's been rotated by forty-five degrees. No. I'm oh, one over x squared. Squared. Oh, yeah, that's not a hyperbola. Yeah, that's the Atari. Yeah, but the Atari, yeah. I'm sure there's a point where it's like symmetrical from each other, right? Well, algebraic at least well symmetrical period. Well here's a, here's what's interesting actually. If you um if you a general quadratic equation in X and Y. In pre calculus we talked about general quadratics in X. Yeah. But what is a general quadratic equation in X and Y? It's gonna have it's gonna, it's gonna include if, um, all, it's going to include terms of degree 2, 1, or 0, 
with every combination of x and y. So algebraically, what I just said right here can be summarized very simply algebraically by saying this. Oh, let me see. Let me yeah. do it like this. Actually, um, actually, let me do it the way that there's a best, there's a better way to do this. Notice this is also a degree two term. X times Y. And this is from what? This is an arbitrary quadratic equation in X and Y. Lots of interesting ideas coming together here. Lots of them. This is actually a pretty hefty section. your notes to match the book. So um, I'm going to make... We could just use the book on the test. <laughs> yeah. <That's true. laughs> the only difference is, and the formulas come out, the formulas are a little easier to remember if you do it this way. B, X, Y, C, Y squared. The rest is the same. The book uses uppercase A, B, and C, but eh, not worried about that. But yeah, so you can see how this is a, a second degree polynomial. It has three terms of degree two, two terms of degree one, and one term of degree zero. And. Wait, well, I don't get it. What's the difference in what you wrote down in that one? Oh, I just put the b. The b is the coefficient for x, y. Yeah. The c is the coefficient for y squared. Yeah, so it was b, y squared. Yeah, but I mean, does that really change? Um, it should be. We're going to be talking about uh, the discriminant. Oh. And it's gonna, I want it to be that way because the discriminant with the quadratic formula, as you know it, is b squared minus 4ac. We're going to be using b squared minus. The same b squared minus 4ac is mm -hmm. an oh, important okay. quantity. Um, in looking at these things because, you know, depending on what each of these constants are, depending on what each of these coefficients are, depending on how I choose them, it could be a circle. Then again, it could be an ellipse or perhaps a parabola or a hyperbola, depending on how it, each of those um, letters are chosen. One, two, three, four, five, six, six coefficients, right? And um, in general, if, the, if this term is missing, it's actually pretty easy to identify what type of conic section is. But if this term is here, it suddenly gets very hard. Okay? And in order to do so, um, it ends up being one of these conic sections, but rotated by an angle. That term has the effect of like rotating it. So is that x, y in a circle? Um, is it in the circle? Well, no, I'm saying, if you take out the, the second term, is yeah. it more likely a circle? Um, no. No. Yeah, it looks like it with the yeah. x squared, y squared. Well, like, OK, for example, like, uh, like one of the things that's characteristic, like notice if I expand this out, right? There's going to be an x squared term. There's going to be an x term and a constant term. If I expand this out, there's going to be a y squared term. There's going to be a y term and a constant term. 
but there's no x y terms oh, okay. you right cool. but one thing that you'll notice though is that the x squared will be positive the y squared will be negative so if there's no x y term but the coefficient for x is positive and the coefficient for y is negative or vice versa y is positive and x is negative so it's going to be hyperbola yeah on the other hand you know parabolas can come in a couple of different forms too i'm kind of starting on the hardest and working my way to the easiest <laughs> actually you know the hard ones are, these are hard because they come in a couple of different forms uh, parabolas can come in a form such as this one P is a distance that I haven't told you about yet. <laughs> so imagine just making them up just now. <laughs> yeah. Back in um, pre-calculus, I would have just put the letter A. Oh, you know? okay. I would and, and, and A wouldn't mean so much. We, we, we just, back then, we would have just said, okay, well, if A is positive, it's opening to the up, and if it's negative, it's going to opening down. Oh, right, right. And that's to the ex that, that was pretty much the extent that we thought about it. But now... <laughs> But now we have, uh, now I can, I can actually, if I think of A as being 1 over 4P, that P has physical meaning in our picture, which I haven't told you about yet. Parabolas can also come in this form as well. Just whether it's open up or down or left or right. Exactly. So you can see how this form corresponds to parabolas like this. This form corresponds to parabolas that are like that. Now ellipses are pretty interesting to understand in parallel to hyperbolas, it almost looks the same. But it only comes in one form. So it's a little bit easier in that it only comes in that form. Say eclipses? That's an ellipse. Dude, I keep saying that too. It sounds cooler. So like, at least in the, in the example of this ellipse that I've drawn here, the center would be right here. The coordinates of the center of this ellipse would be H and, H and K, K. Right? The A is the distance in the X direction to the edge. See that? The B is the distance in the Y direction. I didn't actually tell you what A and B were over here. You know, one thing, one of the properties that hyperbolas all have in common is they have asymptotes. <clears throat> See how, in this case, the asymptotes are the x and the y axes, right? And from the center, I can always draw this like box right here that's going to be tangent to the two branches of the hyperbola. In this case, if I had a hyperbola such as this one that's centered at the origin, I can draw a box that goes right here. over here from the center I can draw a box that goes like this that should be tangent right here and A is the yeah A and B are the dimensions of the box length and height exactly so see how that remember the A goes with X yes yeah, the length so, right 
that sine wave length A, and that would be B. Height. Yeah. Technically, I guess it's half of the height of the box. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the total height would actually be 2B yeah. or 2A. Over here, here, the way I set it up, A is going with Y here. So this would be A. This would be B. So, yeah, so once you draw the box, you can connect the diagonals to find the asymptotes. And then you can just kind of fill in the Wait, branches. wait, wait, say it again? Once you have the box, if I'm starting with the equation and I'm trying to figure out the graph. Oh, okay, so those corners are always where the asymptotes are. First thing you're going to do, you're going to find the center. Then you're going to find the box. Then you're going to draw the diagonals. Then <laughs> the equation of the line is the asymptote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll, do, we'll have to do some examples of that um, probably next week. It seems easier than, didn't we do something like Weak asymptotes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That seems easier mm -hmm. to do, like find this box. Well, that was for functions. See, here, I'm not even dealing with functions here. Functions are not a part of the discussion. None of these yeah. things are function, yeah. functions. Pass the yeah. vertical line. But yeah, when we were, when you're studying rational functions in pre calculus, yeah. we definitely were talking about oblique asymptotes. Yeah. Seems like. Yeah, I kind of like that. I guess if you had. Solve for y so that you would have a function for y. You could maybe use some of those techniques, right? So yeah, yeah. But I think these two are the easiest of the four. You know, this is a little more straightforward, I think. Um, and in the case of a circle, circle is the easiest by far, right? If this, the center of the circle has coordinates h, k, it's just x minus h squared. <laughs> yep. Man. I could take that exam back. <laughs> First test we took last term. I'm over here like, oh no, it must be two two. No, no. <laughs> and you could think of a circle as just being a, an ellipse where A and B are the same. Yeah. And that would be this over R squared, this over R squared equals one. Same equation. So yeah, um, we're kind of starting, starting to see some of the, the intersection of some of these geometric ideas and algebraic ideas how they correlate. Now each of these forms that I've given you are only for graphs that look like this. If I'm thinking of, a, of an ellipse that looks like, like that, it's not going to fall into that form or any of these forms, unfortunately. So you're saying there has to be some... It's going to have a, a non-zero xy term. Notice that if you were to expand each of these, there's not going to be any xy terms here. Right, yeah. If I expand each of these, combine all the like terms, no xy terms there. Not even here. Right? No. So you're saying only the ones where there's like, I guess, some symmetry along the mm -hmm. x and y axis? Yeah. Yeah. So like for instance, like this is just vocabulary. The longer of these two distances is sometimes referred to as the semi-major axis. <laughs> semi because it's half of the whole thing. <laughs> Major because it's the longer one. Yeah. My, and B is minor. Yeah. Minor B is semi. But you can see how the, 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 the minor axis and the major axis are parallel to the X and Y axis. Yeah. Right? Same thing with the hyperbola. You notice that the parabola always has a line of symmetry, right? And that line of symmetry is either parallel to the y-axis or the x-axis. So these are so these forms are very much oriented according to the x and y axes. Okay. But if I want to reorient it at an angle, that's where it gets really fancy. And in order to treat that fully, you would have to um, take linear algebra. Uh, you have to do a uh, linear, linear algebra, algebra. Oh. which is a class that comes later. It is taught at Pierce College. Yeah, we're do it's the next time. But it's not a prerequisite for this class. So to the extent that we're going to talk about this stuff that requires linear algebra, it'll be in the form of just formulas where you just take it on faith. Yeah. And Sometimes I like that more than yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's how learning goes. Even for me, like a lot of times I need to just kind of like feel out the mechanics before I wrestle with the theory, yeah. you know? So I think that's, that's pretty typical. There's more to be said about conic sections, 
right? We got pretty far, and I think this is a, probably enough for today. But yeah, um, what I need to do is I need to revisit all these things next week and talk more about, um, in each of these cases, they, each of these conic sections has what's called a focus and a directrix. And it gives you another perspective on each of these things and how they're related geometrically. It's pretty fascinating. And, um, and then the author, actually, this is a pretty deep section. It even goes even beyond that. No. I'm not, but I'm not going to go beyond what <laughs> this and what I just said. Okay. You know, I'll, I do want to talk about the focus and the directrix. And that's about it. Um, I'll, and I'll just talk about how it plays into each of these pictures. Okay? Okay. And, um, and then we'll be done with Chapter 7. That was, chapter 7 was pretty quick.